an interesting one because for Lewis House, when people say, tell me a little bit about Lewis House, one of the things, one of the ways in which I describe Lewis House is that we sit someplace between the church and the academy. Uh, you know, we, we kind of maybe tilt a little one way or the other sometimes, but really kind of we, we have both of those things, the church and the academy. We sit someplace between uh, the lectern, the academic lectern, and the, the church's pulpit. So someplace in the middle is where Lewis House resides. And so we have this really keen interest in, in the university. We feel called to the modern university. And it's been interesting to me as someone who's been doing campus ministry now for 19 years. I also uh, have worked in and do work in a place it's called Christian Student Fellowship, CSF, which is uh, building this place across the way here. Uh, hopefully nothing blows up because I saw they were digging gas lines uh, earlier tonight uh, over there. I was like, oh, this is, seems a little scary, but they're, they're far enough away from us. I think we'll be okay. But, uh, you know, as someone who's been on the university campus for 19 years, I have seen a growing awareness in our culture of the formational aspects of the modern university. I, I, as I've talked to people and, and I've certainly talked to students and, and talking to people who are beyond the college years, and, and there's just a lot of questions swirling about of what is the nature of a university? What's it, what's it here to do? What's it, what's it for? And, and people you know, who are reflecting back on maybe their university years and, and seeing that maybe the, the modern university, the contemporary university has, has shifted in some ways. And so so it's just raising a lot of profound questions, questions that are, are deeply important for us to ask. And so we're just honored to have uh, Dr. Deneen with us tonight to, to give a talk of just how, how he became a Christian academic and just some, some, some reflections that he has on the modern university. And so tonight... It's my privilege and pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Patrick Deneen. Dr. Deneen is a political scientist who's been at the University of Notre Dame since 2012. Before his move to the Midwest, he spent most of his education out east. Uh, he completed his undergraduate and graduate degrees from Rutgers University. Then he taught at Princeton University for eight years and Georgetown University for seven before making his way to being an Irish guy, although you know, you're wearing that, that Alabama-type jacket tonight, which I would think both from where you teach at Notre Dame, Alabama wouldn't be great. And then we just got killed by Alabama this past weekend, So, the, but forgive him. He says it's just a festive holiday jacket. It has nothing to do with, with uh, Alabama. But his specialty is political science, but his work has mostly focused in political theory about how the ideas and assumptions which underpin uh, how, we, how our, our communal life is ordered and, and how communities are, are work together. And he's come to be especially known as a critic of what might be called capital L liberalism. Uh, he's written numerous books, the most prominent of which uh, that, that some of you know, may, maybe some of you have read and, and certainly seen uh, different people talk about is Why Liberalism Failed. Interestingly enough, that book, Why Liberalism Failed, uh, if you we've got some copies there in the back, uh, it actually has a blurb on it by President Obama. And President Obama even wrote that he found it thought-provoking while still, he didn't agree with a lot of the, the where the arguments headed, but he still found the force of the arguments interesting. So I just I thought it was interesting that someone like President Obama would say, hey, I don't agree with this, but gosh, I can't, I can't argue that this is, uh, this is very persuasively argued, even if I don't find it ultimately persuasive. Uh, Professor Deneen has written on many major publications, written for many major publications on a host of issues in addition to politics. Tonight, uh, we're honored to have uh, Dr. Deneen with us, and so would you put your hands together and welcome him to the Lewis House. Thank you so much. I, I'm sorry that I'm uh, wearing this triggering jacket. <laughs> no, Notre Dame had a bye week last uh, this past Saturday, so I didn't even know there was any football on, so I apologize for <laughs> not being clued in. Uh, it actually, it, it, I, I pulled it out and thought, you know, I haven't worn this since last uh, holiday season, since we're a week out from Thanksgiving. I thought, well, I'll give this brush off the dust, so that's really what it's about. I want to thank, uh, thank Lewis House, uh, Derek, and, and the staff here, uh, Stephanie, for uh, the invitation and all of the, all the assistance in bringing me here, and it's been a wonderful day. I've had great conversations. I'm really delighted to meet so many of you. Uh, and to talk about a, a, a topic near and dear to my heart. Um, uh, the, the title was assigned to me, uh, and I don't, I don't object to the title, but as I began thinking about it more, Christians and the University, Reflections on Faith in Higher Education, 
I really thought that what I kind of wanted to talk about and what um, might be of interest to you, since many of you, I assume most of you are Christians and you are in the university, would be to talk about Christians in the university, or at least start by talking about Christians in the, in the modern university. And I think as was suggested in the introduction, and it won't be a surprise perhaps to many of you, it's not a terribly easy relationship these days, uh, that there's, uh, there are tensions uh, in being a Christian in the modern university. And I'm always struck by this, given that how many universities, I'm, I haven't really looked around uh, University of Kentucky today, but uh, certainly many that I've visited, usually have some number of buildings that look kind of medieval somewhere on the campus. Uh, they look like they're, they're from a, you know, several hundred, if not a thousand years ago. Uh, and in spite of these medieval looking buildings on many campuses, uh, if they are fortresses, they seem to be defending something very different from the beliefs and the way of life uh, uh, that were regnant at the time when the, model, uh, when the models, original models of those buildings inspired the creation of those modern versions. So rather, rather than begin with you know, being a professor type um, and putting on my, you know, my, my professor hat and beginning with a kind of elaborate theoretical and philosophical and historical and theological examination of how this tension and uneasy relationship began, I thought I would tell my story in a more personal way. And I'm tempted to say that since it's, this is a Protestant organization, this is, I know this is a place where you give your personal testimony. So as a Catholic, I'm not always comfortable with that, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna put on the, yeah, I'm gonna put on the, the personal testimony garb for the night. Yeah. Closer, okay. So the first thing to acknowledge is that I didn't begin my scholarly career in any self-conscious way as a Christian scholar. I entered graduate school probably like a lot of people who entered graduate school. I was really turned on by the world of ideas, by books and arguments and the kinds of topics uh, that were explored. I just didn't want to, once I graduated, like a lot of pro future professors, I didn't want to leave. I just didn't want to leave the environment of the campus. Uh, I kind of thought the university was itself the real world, not the place they told me was the real. I thought the university was where reality really was explored. And I was especially inspired by the topic that I became a surprise to me, who I wasn't someone really especially political when I grew up, uh, but I was became more and more intrigued by courses and faculty who taught in the field that I, that I now teach in, political philosophy, which persuaded me that political philosophy was a kind of main key by which you can unlock an understanding of the way, of why the world was the way that it is. That it was a kind of, you know, the, the red pill, uh, to use the matrix image, that you could actually see reality if you, uh, if you really had a deep understanding of the ideas that underlie the things that in some ways we take for granted. And so I took both my undergraduate degree and my doctoral degree at Rutgers University, which is the fancy way of saying the University of New Jersey, so big state university. Uh, and I only went to public schools my entire life, uh, so this was, uh, this was my kind of, uh, the world I was comfortable with. My dissertation was on the Odyssey, I think as may have been mentioned, was on the Odyssey of Homer, which is a great book, and a book that deserves many readings and rereadings, but it's not especially a Christian book. Uh, it, might, it might have some elements that eventually find their way into Christianity, but it's not a book that, of course, it's written before uh, the Incarnation. I was raised Catholic, but by the time I went to college, I just didn't want to get up anymore on Sunday mornings, and kind of fell away as a practice and really not something I much thought about. So by the time I was in graduate school, Christianity was kind of largely non-existent as a concern and certainly as anything that was relevant to my graduate education. I didn't see my childhood Catholicism as really relevant to my academic trading, uh, to my training and my budding career. Instead, I had all of the dominant concerns of a graduate student and then eventually a newly minted PhD. I was, of course, obsessed with getting a job, any job in academia. I didn't care if it was a good job or a bad job, and I can't tell you the names of the schools where I got rejected 
Before I was got given an offer at Princeton University, these are schools that were in such backwater places, they, you know, you would have to chop your way through a forest to find them. In order to get a job, this also made me very concerned, as all graduate students, PhDs, and professors are with publishing, publish or perish, articles, papers, book reviews, turning my dissertation into a book. I wanted to teach, but I had also internalized the lesson that had been hammered into me through my graduate training was that teaching was necessarily secondary to the main job of securing a job and eventually getting tenure and promotion, all of which would mainly come about on the strength of my research record. So in addition to the work I did as a graduate student, writing on the Odyssey of Homer, a great book, learning to publish, learning to become relevant in my discipline, becoming known as an expert in my field. This, or these were the, main, the key lessons that I learned and that everyone learns in graduate school. And every professor that you have ever had, for you students here, this was, in addition to their field, this is what you learn and this is what you internalize. These lessons are identical and homogenous and universal in higher education. It, for all the talk today of diversity, every faculty member learns these priorities. Publish, become relevant and an expert in your area, become known to the people in your area, and eventually, hopefully, you will become the recognized expert in your field. It doesn't matter where you go to graduate school, at least in terms of this lesson. It doesn't matter what subject one studies, whether it's the sciences, humanities, social sciences. It doesn't matter what the topic of one's dissertation is. It doesn't matter whether one hopes to get a job at a prestigious Ivy League school or a large state university, a private research university, a private liberal arts college. What matters above all is that one internalizes the basic teachings and commitments that one learns in one's graduate education. Research, publish, gain recognition and esteem in one's area of expertise from the other members and people working in your area. Now what was never discussed as one is going through graduate education is why? What's the end? or the purpose of this teaching. What was conveyed is that this activity of publishing and becoming an expert is the key activity of the scholar and implicitly as the means of success and prestige in the profession of academia. And like all of my peers, I, lo I largely internalized these lessons in a kind of unthinking manner. My first academic position, as was mentioned, was a kind of bolt of the blue a kind of, on the one hand, a place very close to where I went to college, Princeton University. It's 20 minutes down the road from Rutgers. But it may as well have been a world away. It may as well have been a million miles away. And it was, I attribute my years at Princeton as the beginning of a kind of turning and a kind of examination that I didn't undertake largely when I was in graduate school. The beginning of a kind of examined life which you sort of think is automatically accompanies becoming an academic. Becoming a faculty member at Princeton was something of an experience of being a stranger in a strange land, a description that often is, fits a Christian as well. I was constantly sort of haunted by a sense of disquiet at Princeton, and some of this had certain class elements. And I don't mean that you know I was a poor kid you know, suddenly found his way into Princeton, it's a little bit more, I didn't go to the kinds of schools that people who teach at Princeton and who go to Princeton had gone to. I went to good schools, good public schools, but I didn't, I didn't have quite the same language and quite the same bearing as my colleagues. It was a strange place in some ways that felt there were codes and ways of speaking that weren't entirely familiar to me. I was surrounded by people who felt keenly, if unselfconsciously at ease in this setting and who readily recognized members of their own tribe, whether it was Princeton or people visiting from Harvard or what you will. 
there was already among them a shared understanding among the faculty of the path and the kinds of, you know, the steps that needed to be taken to become successful, to become professionally successful. And I kind of had to glean these from conversations in which I always felt like I was a little bit outside on the edge of the party. You've ever had that experience? You know, you're kind of on the edge and you're trying to listen in. What is it that all those cool people are talking about? And I was hoping for crumbs of news like a tolerated guest at a party that I was mistakenly invited to. But above all for me, it was implicitly the hostility that I experienced toward religious people and toward Christians who were among the worst of those who were regarded as the class of bad people, implicitly, and largely shared without any kind of examination by my colleagues. Christians as the paramount example of, of, of bad people, but which included people like conservatives, rural people, or what was frequently referred to by my colleagues as flyover country, places that you never went to. You flew from one coast to another. Now, this dismissiveness toward Christians was couched in a rejection of their irrationality, their bigotry, their intolerance. But these views of dismissiveness toward Christians and conservatives and rural people and people who lived in flyover country was expressed in terms of bigotry and intolerance and seemed to be inspired by itself by a form of irrationality. And it was this fact being somewhat on the outside and seeing this, that became a kind of spur to an examination of a question that had been largely unasked and certainly unanswered during my years as a graduate student. What were the implicit ends of this education that I and all academics, people involved in academia, had been shaped and formed to be participants in? And right around this time, I began teaching a course I called it the end, of ed, the end of education. I teach it almost every other year. I've been teaching it now for about 20 years. Now, it began purportedly as a course for students, but it was really a course for me. I felt I really had to engage with an examination of what the ends and purposes of education were because I really wasn't sure anymore. Something that itself was not the subject of examination as a scholar who was just sort of givens, publish or perish. Now at the same time, I, when I was really beginning to engage with this question of what is the end and purpose of education, I was encountering these vociferous anti-Christian sentiments among my colleagues. Increasingly, not just as a kind of tick or a, you know, a kind of form of identity, you know, identity marker, but actually as, ex as an expression of an underlying organizing principle of contemporary higher education. Now, I was very fortunate at the time that as a political philosopher, I was regularly teaching works by Christians as a part of the curriculum in political theory, which includes typically works by Augustine and Aquinas, but I was also teaching from time to time figures like Dante, John Henry, Cardinal Newman, Reinhold Niebuhr, and a number of others. So not only was I increasingly finding disquieting the irrational, even bigoted view toward Christians among my colleagues, but I came increasingly to see these Christian authors and the arguments of these Christian authors as fundamentally true, as persuasive, as profound, as deserving of serious attention by a place like an academy like Princeton. And indeed that these beliefs seemed to be superior to those that I was encountering among my, among my colleagues. This gradual then development, both of a sense of a certain distance from my own institution and the education that had led me there, and an increasingly sympathetic view toward the Christianity that I'd had and embraced as a child, but which now was gaining a kind of mature understanding increasingly began to inform my own understanding of what was happening at these institutions. I began as well for the first time since, uh, um, since childhood to return to worship as a part of this kind of awakening. 
to the insufficiencies of what my education had provided me. And unless in some ways I had encountered this more intellectual, mature form of Christianity, I might well have ended up as one of those statistics of the growing number of nuns, which unfortunately is not N-U-N-S. It should be, but it's not. So I credit Princeton, ironically enough, and its hostility to Christianity as providing for me this great impetus and spur to a kind of intellectual and spiritual awakening. Now in the intervening decades, it's been about 30 years in higher education, I've developed fairly considered and strong views of, about the nature of the modern university. The modern university, I would submit, is a faith-based institution that has been, been designed around largely and deeply and fundamentally anti-Christian views. Not just anti-Christianity, but views and beliefs that are contrary to Christianity. Christians can teach at these institutions, but generally on the terms that their views should be relegated to the realm of private belief and should be understood by all parties to bear little to no relationship or relevance to the real work of academia. The so-called tolerance and embrace of diversity at these institutions does not extend to anyone who is vocally Christian, typically, with the exception of some rare institutions, since by definition, Christian beliefs run contrary to the deepest faith principles of the modern university. Like any faith-based institution, these institutions have their own form of inclusion, who is a member, and forms of exclusion. And if one expresses views that are contrary to the faith commitments of the modern university, one can be removed on the grounds of heresy, but which today is called harm or hostile work environment or triggering. And the star chamber is no longer the Inquisition, but the human resources department. Almost as bad. In all likelihood, increasingly, Christians, certainly people who are explicitly Christian, will not find positions in modern universities, secular universities especially, given the increasingly explicit faith tests that are now required as a, uh, as a, uh, as a basic requirement for employment. Mission statements, statements of one's belief in the form of diversity, equity, and inclusion statements that are read very closely by those who are charged with hiring faculty. And if one doesn't express certain beliefs that are often contrary to the beliefs of Christians, one can expect not to be invited to campus for an interview. And it's interesting that a uh, place like where I teach Notre Dame uh, rejects the idea that such faith statements should be relevant when it comes to Catholicism, but increasingly some departments are asking for DEI statements uh, as a, a part of the hiring process. Here's the hard truth. These faith, faith commitments that I'll talk a little bit more um, in detail in a moment of the modern university reflect and shape the wider society and the political order. There's really no escaping them. Either institutions conform to them or the institutions will be marginalized or outright forced to conform or desist. In most cases, however, the force of law or the threat of law is not needed because the impulse to conformity comes from within. The gravitational pull of this modern order arranged around basic if implicit hostility to, to Christianity is finally too strong for most institutions as institutions to ignore and increasingly impossible to resist. And I say this as someone who has taught at two religiously affiliated institutions of the three institutions I've taught at. Princeton, originally a, a, a Presbyterian school, but secular by the time I taught there. Georgetown University, which may shock and surprise some of you to learn that it was originally, I shouldn't say the original was, is still, claims to be, a Catholic and Jesuit university, the oldest Catholic university in the country, and the University of Notre Dame. 
undoubtedly, I think, the world's most prestigious Catholic university and possibly even most prestigious religious university and arguably the world's wealthiest Catholic institution, at least until the Vatican liquidates its art collection. Georgetown, it is widely agreed, is largely a lost cause. If its faculty are no longer Catholic, which is not anything that anyone inquires about, but it's clear it's not. If its students are no longer Catholic, and it's less than 50% who state that they're Catholic, and of those, very few are practicing. If its theology department largely avoids teaching Catholic theology in favor of religious studies, and so forth, if, if, if its curriculum is not Catholic, in what ways is it a Catholic institution? I left Georgetown in 2012, somewhat noisily, having seen that it shed more and more of its Catholic elements over the seven years that I taught there, to the point at which I believed it would become difficult to teach from a fundamentally Catholic Christian standpoint without bringing down protests and cause for dismissal by students, and likely the quiet acquiescence of the administration. Now, in the 11 and a half years I've been at Notre Dame, the trends have been the same. The institution was, at the time I joined it, and still remains more recognizably Catholic than Georgetown, even when I began my tenure at DC. But each year, by at least the measurements we're given, there are fewer Catholic faculty. And by all appearances and anecdotal evidence, fewer Catholic students. We're told that the campus, uh, the um, halls, the dormitories, each of which has a chapel, are emptier and emptier every year, uh, uh, chapel masses. Many, even a majority of the departments at Notre Dame increasingly hire based on the same criteria as those used at secular, what, the, what are called aspirational peer institutions, with those being typically named like Stanford, Duke, and the University of Pennsylvania, because who doesn't want to be like the University of Pennsylvania? So while at least on the surface the institution appears solidly Catholic, beneath the surface the trends are ominous and similar to those at Georgetown, ominously similar. Now many Catholics and other Christian critics of the likes of Georgetown and Notre Dame, many came out of the woodwork last week because Notre Dame held its first drag show on campus, a signal event in our history. Many will point often to the controversial decisions made by weak or seemingly hostile administrators as a main source of their grievance over these trends. Many people still recall with great consternation the decision of the current president, outgoing president, Father John Jenkins, the president of Notre Dame, to, in, at the, to invite and confer an honorary degree upon then President Obama, who delivered the commencement address in 2009. And as far as this goes, these critiques are not entirely wrong. But if we widen the aperture, we see these same trends everywhere, a conformity to the largely unexamined faith commitments of the likes of Princeton. It's not just Georgetown or Notre Dame that are trending in this direction of their secular peer. Every religious institution that seeks respectability on the broader terms of academia is inevitably destined to take the same path. Nearly every one of the Christian legacy institution trends in the same direction. And why is that? Because parents want their children to be successful in this world. Children, students want to be successful on the terms of this world. Students want to attend as high, highly ranked a school as they can. Administrators follow the broad guidelines of what constitutes prestige, and hence always the attention to aspirational peers. Faculty are shaped by these institutions and their beliefs. The emphasis on research, the emphasis on publication, tenure, hiring, and so forth, based on these criteria. These all exert a powerful force that leads to the society becoming more like the institutions at which the leaders, of this, uh, the leaders of this country, the leaders of this nation are formed. Okay, so if this is the case, 
What is the nature, what are the elements of this contemporary hostility toward Christianity? What are the elements then of the faith tradition of a place like Princeton that has colonized many, if not most, of what were originally Christian institutions? So in the remainder of my talk, I want to be a little bit more precise, I suppose, a little less uh, giving my personal testimony. Let me lay out um, four of what I see as the deepest, broadly modern assumptions, and then lay out how these four deep modern assumptions are manifest as fundamental elements of the modern university. And then I'll end by suggesting four contrary ways of seeing the world and understanding the world through the, through the ideas of four thinkers that have helped shape my understanding, three of whom I'm sorry, one of whom is not Christian, but it's Aristotle, so he's an honorary Christian, <laughs> at, least, at least according to, according to Thomas Aquinas. So here, I'm, I'm gonna do this very brief, very, uh, give a very brief, uh, uh, just summary statement of the four main beliefs that I think inform the modern worldview that defines the basic commitments of the modern university, that I think are, form its faith commitments, its unexamined assumptions, if I can put it in that way. The first and most central that won't be surprised, those of you who know any of my work uh, and my critiques of liberalism, is a contemporary understanding and a non-Christian understanding of what freedom is, how to understand what is freedom. Freedom in the modern understanding, or in the liberal understanding, is a near universally understood and unexamined understanding to be the absence of external obstacle to the achievement of my desires. The autonomy of the liberated self to act as one wishes with all choices essentially being permitted unless it can be shown and proven that that activity causes harm to someone else, possibly to yourself, but mostly harm to someone else. This conception of freedom is contrary to the classical Christian, the classical and Christian understanding of liberty, which is freedom is the condition when one has achieved a condition of self-governance, the conquering of sin, the conquering of one's inclination to sin, freedom in Christ, not freedom from Christ. Notice that the modern understanding of liberty and that operates in the background and the assumptions of the modern university is drawn from this modern understanding. So when I begin by saying that the modern university is contrary to Christianity, this would be point one. Second, following from this understanding of freedom, there's no way to rank our desires and there's no way to reconcile con conflicting desires. So society becomes organized around the effort to expand to the greatest extent possible the conditions that allow for the possibility of people to pursue any and all desires and to minimize the friction that might result from that pursuit. The result is especially an emphasis upon expanding the material conditions that are seen as the best means of promoting individual liberty and a corresponding rise of materialism as the main avenue by which liberty is realized and pursued. So it becomes wed to kind of material measurements. Right? We know we're a successful society if the GDP is rising. That's how we know we're successful. Right? If, if other statistics are also rising, loneliness, suicide, and so forth, those are considered secondary to the rise of GDP. And so while in modern America we tend to think there's a pretty radical divide between the political left and the political right in their beliefs, there's a central agreement that the nature of freedom is really materialistic. It's really based on a material foundation. Both sides agree on this even if they disagree about how to achieve that end. And the debate is really one of means rather than over ends. And that's how, how often faith traditions proceed. Third, the means or the main means of securing the expansion of freedom and the enjoyment of all possible goods in the material realm becomes a utilitarian mindset that applies instrumental rationality, a calculation of costs and benefits, of usefulness versus non-usefulness, to an increasing sphere of life and ultimately all spheres of life. You know, 
personal relationships, use of one's time, whether or not leisure is useful or not. The basic utilitarian insight that the main aim of life should be to increase pleasure and de decrease pain reshapes many institutions and activities of modern life. And the aims of our institutions, our education, our economics becomes the maximization of utility and efficiency. The evaluation of things or practices and ultimately people centers on their utility and why it is that a society will increasingly decide that people who are not useful are no longer needed, or people who are not yet useful also are not needed. Fourth and lastly, and I could go on at greater length, this is just sort of the four main hits here, the best way to achieve all of these above forms of living and the achievement of this form of liberty is through the increasing separation of human beings from each other in the form of individualism. And the separation of more and more aspects of life into separate spheres, to separate rather than to combine, to disintegrate rather than to integrate. One way this is, you know, we see this on a college campus is, you know, the way we're highly specialized. Society is organized along highly rationalized forms that allows for the fullest possible differentiation of our roles and our activities. Everything becomes sort of customizable, right? Our daily life, every aspect of our daily life, our individual expression can be tailored and customized. And this is also expressed through a highly developed division of labor in the economic realm, as well as a growing set of bureaucratic arrangements that increasingly isolate subspecializations of work in which we know more and more about less and less. Now these basic four forms, I want to say four, four commitments of the modern world are seen deeply instantiated in the modern university and were for me the increasing source of disquiet the more time I spent in the university. And moreover, I saw them more and more clearly as contradictions of what was increasingly the Christian turn in my understanding and my scholarship. The institutions no longer matched my beliefs. In fact, I saw, thought myself increasingly working and living in a kind of hostile environment. And what's striking even more is that these transformations to the universities, originally Christian institutions, were the exact contradiction and opposite of what had originally animated these institutions. So let me go through quickly these four ways that we see these four points instantiated in the modern university. First, we see in our modern understanding of freedom the move at most universities away from core curriculum, or any curriculum, any curriculum at all. The curriculum is the most you know, sort of vague set of distribution requirements. You probably have those here, I'm guessing. They certainly aren't defined by particular classes, much less particular books, particular course of studies that you share with your colleagues, your fellow students, and over which then you have some shared understanding of a set of ideas that then you can converse about outside of classroom and have as a kind of shared civilizational understanding of who we are and what we care about. A curriculum then, the word, you know, it's appropriate, I mean, in Kentucky, the word curriculum comes from course, to run a course, to run like a horse race. It's the expectation that there are certain subjects, disciplines, topics, books, authors, that one should have as an inheritance of being an educated person in a civilization. We also see the withdrawal of the university from the idea that they are engaged in the shaping of the character of students and more that they are in the business of allowing and permitting and encouraging students to be whatever they want to be, to do whatever it is they want to do. At Notre Dame, the, the motto of our college, the College of Arts and Letters, is study everything, do anything. That's the object and aim of education, do anything. I just don't think that's a good motto for a Catholic university, but call me crazy. And one further aspect of this is the de definite and traceable loosening of academic standards and expectations. As, as a curriculum declines, 
one sees also a rising GPA among the student body. The expectations and standards cease to exist and therefore we are not able to evaluate students on any kind of common basis of evaluation. Now the way that administrators and even students justify this is that we're all getting smarter and smarter. But I can tell you I have been in this business for 30 years and students are not all getting smarter and smarter. I'm not saying you're necessarily getting dumber and dumber, but you are definitely not smarter and smarter. Okay, secondly, regarding our materialism. Well, of course, you know this well. We see the near unanimous assumption by both parents and students and administrators that the college is mainly about career preparation. That it is basically about preparing students to be able to make money and as much money as possible. This view has been increasingly formalized by a succession of administrations, and I'm talking about presidential administrations, the national government, Democratic and Republican, which has increasingly instituted and required as a, as a, re a requirement of receiving financial aid, uh, a rating system that will evaluate colleges based on the earning power of graduates. This will be the basis on which we evaluate whether a college is good or bad, or how much money our students making. Now, I'm not against making money, but is this the basis of what, how we understand what a good education is? And of course, we also see, I teach at Notre Dame, and you're here at University of Kentucky, we know this well, we see the dominance of money as a major driver of decisions on college campuses, particularly the growing and, yes, dare I say, morally bankrupting role of sports, big time sports, and its ethos that winning is all that matters, and one must do anything to win what used to be unusual, the one and done, which you all invented here, now is everywhere. We're not even gonna pretend anymore about educating students. We're just gonna give you a year, win for us, and we're gone. This corruption not only corrupts the basic fabric of campuses, but notice it reverberates throughout the entire society at large. I can't tell you now how much I pay attention to. I teach at Notre Dame, and when I watch ESPN and they talk about Notre Dame, they talk about it as a sports team. It's irrelevant that it's a university. It's just a sports team, and that's all it is. Third, regarding utilitarianism. Not only, of course, do we see the growing emphasis upon money making, but there is a, a kind of resulting and corresponding emphasis upon the STEM disciplines, the science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, at the expense of the humanities and the, and the um, liberal arts and, the human and, and those social sciences that have humanities at their core. That is to say, practical subjects, which have practical application, as opposed to ones that are increasingly deemed to be ornamental and laughably irrelevant. I don't know if you, you're probably, a lot of you aren't old enough to remember when President Obama dismissively mentioned art history majors as something that was irrelevant and impractical. But he's not to be outdone by the many growing number of conservatives who once upon a time defended the great books but increasingly see teachers of the great books or teachers of the humanities as a kind of fifth column of woke indoctrination and simply want to get rid of the humanities altogether. An ever increasing amount of resources on campus is directed then to the STEM disciplines while in some schools entire departments in the humanities are being shuttered. And lastly, regarding the organizing principle of separation and specialization, of individuation, the organizing principle on campuses today is one of ever-increasing specialization. In the first case, of course, among the faculty, as I've already mentioned, whose main work is, right, we understand our work as I began by saying, my education at Rutgers. We're about publishing specialized research for six other people. There have been studies done that have shown that work produced by scholars are typically read zero times. <laughs> and yet on the basis of that work, one will receive a job and tenure, presumably. And those are the popular ones. The main work of a faculty then is specialized research and not in their role as teachers. And it's as teachers that we are especially, especially for teaching undergraduates, that we are kept in touch with what a university is. Think of the word, the universal. 
that which is universal, that which touches on everything. It's an 18-year-old who wants to know the meaning of life, typically. And when, the, when you get to the point where you're so highly specialized that that's no longer a relevant question, you tend to forget what 18-year-olds really care about, the kinds of questions they want to have answered, and why it's often the case that the full professors who spent their entire career doing narrow kinds of research tend not to be the most interesting in the classroom. So this place, this, these institutions where I've spent my adult life, my entire adult life since I've been 18 years old, is one that underwent a profound transformation from institutions that were built in the period of Christendom, in the Middle Ages, it's not a mistake that they have these forms, and were once affiliated with Christian churches. Almost every private school in America was originally built, created, put up, put up, stone upon stone by people in religious traditions that were places that not un uncoincidentally were devoted to teaching core curricula focused on the great works of our tradition, aimed at shaping the virtues of people to become good people, to have good character, which encouraged students to think about their vocations, not just their jobs, but their vocations as contributors to the broader social order, not simply as a form of money making. This was achieved by a focus on the liberal arts that reflected the college, the collegiums, the colleagues understanding that their main role was one as educators and served as the connecting tissue that brought together all the various parts of inquiry, that no discipline could understand the phenomenon of what it was to be a human in this created universe on our own. And that's why you have colleges that have all these various departments, right? It would make a lot more efficient sense if we just had a college of chemistry. University of Kentucky, College of Chemistry. University of Chicago, College of Biology. Right? Just bring, better all, bring together all the biologists. The fact we have all these various majors and, and faculty in different disciplines is still a reflection of this Christian origin in which to know and to understand creation means we have to see the way in which it connects. Now, as I've already mentioned, I came to understand these interconnected broader forces that were shaping the transformation of the university, mainly through my teaching of the texts in my discipline, political philosophy, and my turn, my increasing turn to the Christian faith. I want to credit four thinkers especially, and, and, then I'll, and then I'll knock off and we can talk a little bit. All of whom I think in various ways reflect a contrary view to these four dimensions of the modern university, reflect a different faith. The first is a pagan, I've already mentioned Aristotle, but he was baptized by Aquinas, as I've also mentioned. I want to mention one passage from Aristotle that occurs in book one of his politics. This is Aristotle. He says, for as man is the best of animals when perfected, so he is the worst when separated from law and justice. Man is the best of animals when brought to his telos, telane, He's the worst when separated from law and justice. For injustice is most pernicious when it possesses weapons. And man is born possessing weapons for the use of wisdom and virtue, but which is possible to employ for entirely different ends. We have tools that can give us wisdom and virtue, but those same tools, our rationality, can be used to different ends, opposite ends. Hence, when devoid of virtue, Man is the most unholy and savage of animals, and the worst in regard to sex and food. Now, anyone who thinks Aristotle's boring just hasn't paid attention. I mean, he talks about sex and food. What's sexier and foodier than that? <laughs> so what's this passage mean, and why does he talk about sex and food? Well, it's clear. We're the worst of all animals when it comes to sex and food. How are we doing on those two fronts, by the way, as a civilization? How are we doing on sex and food? We're pretty bad on both those fronts. I mean, we're not really good with food. We eat like animals much of the time in our cars, slopping out of, you know, bags or wrappers, eating with our fingers or throwing our mouths into things. And I don't even want to talk about sex. I won't. What Aristotle is saying is that these two phenomena that are born of our appetites, there's no more vivid and immediate appetite than sex and food. 
and being hungry and being horny. Those two things, right? They're kind of hard to deny. If they are untutored, they make us into the most savage of beasts, right? These appetites. If we act on our appetites, we are worse than the most savage of beasts because we can create tools as regards sex and food and be even worse than the animals. But with proper discipline and training, the use of these tools, our appetites become something more than appetites. Think of the finest meal you've ever attended in a great restaurant. I had, took my wife 30th anniversary to Louis Sanc in Paris, France, five-star Michelin restaurant. I'm still paying for it. I'll be paying for it for the rest of my life. The greatest meal of our lives. My wife was gonna put down her purse. They brought a little ottoman for it before it could touch the ground. It was a miracle. We had, I don't know, 14 forks, 70 knives, 50 spoons. It was fabulous. And this thing, this basic appetite, the eating of food became this magnificent event, this memorable, beautiful event. And Aristotle is speaking of how something so basic as our appetites can become something elevated. And of course, the same is true of sex, something so basic and potentially animalistic. When contained within the discipline of courtship and, and, and the proposal of marriage, and then in the marital bonds, is something that's really incomparably beautiful. Something so basic and elemental becomes truly almost divinely human. This is what Aristotle is speaking of. What's our world? What's taught at universities? What is, the, what is our understanding of these phenomena? Are we Aristotelian or are we Hobbesian? The second thinker who helps me understand and appreciate the Christian alter alternative is St. Augustine. Of course, St. Augustine goes without saying one must read Augustine, his many works, I'll only mention one, again, one phrase, one paragraph for him. He speaks of the two cities in book 14 of the City of God. The two cities, therefore, he writes, were created by the two loves. The earthly city, by love of oneself, even to the point of contempt for God, and the heavenly city, by the love of God, even to the point of contempt for oneself. The first glories in itself, the second glories in God. The first seeks glory from human beings. God, who is witness of the conscience, is the greatest glory of the other. These two cities, Augustine suggests, form contrasts with each other, deep and profound contrasts with each other. The city of man is about the love of, is driven by the love of self, the love of pride, superbia, right? The libido dominandi, the love of domination. The city of God is defined by love, self-giving love, a self-emptying love. What Augustine in part points to is that all earthly cities are insufficient. They're all imperfect. And they're all imperfect because we are in these earthly cities always informed by the libido dominandi. But we have available to us this aspiration and understanding of the nature of the city of God. And above all, that human cities organized around the libido dominandi will be places of viciousness and even terror, the love of dominion. Whereas places organized around love, the self-giving love, in imitation of Christ, faith, hope, and love is the Christian standard. That above all, earthly cities modeled on the city of God cannot be based merely on justice. Justice is a good and we should seek justice. But justice is also for us an impossible standard. And I think about this today when we speak of equity, diversity, equity, and inclusion, in which equity seems to mean everyone should either be treated exactly the same or everyone needs to be treated differently on the basis of their status as victims and kind of modulates between the two. Notice how impossible it is to reconcile these two things. Are we being treated equally by being treated differently? Or do we, need to be, do, we need, do we need all to be treated equally because that's the only way to have justice? Either of these standards is really fundamentally unjust. Without love, without charity, without gift, 
Justice is ultimately unjust. No human organization, no human society can achieve, achieve justice. And what we ought to aspire to, Augustine teaches us, is a society based more on the ideals of love, the city of God, rather than the libido dominandi of the city of man. The third thinker who really began to help me understand and think through the nature of the modern university and its contrast is someone who you'll find frequently in my works, who I rely on often, the Frenchman Alexis de Tocqueville. Again, like all of these thinkers, you should read the whole book. I'm just going to give you the tiniest taste. But in one of my favorite passages, which is chapter 13 of part two of volume two of Democracy in America, Tocqueville writes on the fo his following fascination with what he sees in America. He's an aristocrat who's coming from France. And he notices that Americans are always busy, 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 busy. And so he writes a chapter, Why Americans Are So Restless in the Midst of Their Prosperity. I'm going to quote from him for a little bit. Quote, in America, I saw the freest and most enlightened men placed in the happiest circumstances that the world affords. And it seemed to me, nevertheless, that a cloud habitually hung upon their brow. And I thought them serious and almost sad, even in their pleasures. It is strange to see with what feverish ardor the Americans pursue their own welfare and watch the vague dread that constantly torments them lest, that they, that lest they should not have chosen the shortest path with which to lead it. In the United States, he goes on, a man builds a house in which to spend his old age and he sells it before the roof is on. He plants a garden and lets it just as the trees are coming into bearing. He brings a field into tillage and leaves other men to gather the crops. He embraces the profession and gives it up. He settles in a place which he soon afterwards leaves to carry on his changeable longings elsewhere. Death at length overtakes him, but it is before he is weary of his bootless chase of that complete felicity which forever escapes him. It's a very powerful passage on restlessness, the restlessness of the American or the modern person who seeks freedom. And part of what Tocqueville is describing is what I can only describe as a kind of institutionalized discontent. To be taught and tutored in the belief that something better is always around the corner. That to settle, to commit, to stay put, what's the opposite of enquiète, restless, quiet, quiet, still, right? able to be still that this institutionalized discontent is one of the hallmarks and features of the modern age. Right? It's Thomas Hobbes who describes the nature of man as being driven by the restless desire that ceaseth, uh, the restless desire, the restless, restlessness of desire, after desire of desire after desire that ceaseth only in death. That we want thing after thing after thing, experience after experience that ceaseth only in death. We are driven by this constant desire of more accumulation, not to settle. The freedom that is the foundation of the modern world breeds this intense and endless anxiety, whether I've made the right choices, whether I pursued the right things, whether I've chosen the right career, whether I've settled in the right place, whether I've dated or married the right person. Can I swipe left again? You don't know what that means, good for you. And the more opportunities that are open to us, the more anxious and even more unhappy we become. The pursuit of happiness, rather than happiness, becomes just that, pursuit without happiness. Tocqueville urges his readers to resist the spirit of the age, particularly by finding forms of contentment and satisfaction with those people we happen to find ourselves with, our families, our communities, the local uh, circumstances from which satisfaction can be attained. And Christianity offers a particular form of solace, the example of many holy men and women who are driven by a kind of longing and a restlessness, but for communion with God, right? Augustine begins his confessions on this note, right? My heart was restless until it rests in thee. But recognition of the sacred restlessness can lead to a form of peaceableness as we traverse our path in this world. 
And one can witness this in the exemplary lives of so many saints, from St. Benedict to St. Francis, from St. Therese of the Little Flower to St. Mother Teresa. And lastly, I would be remiss not to mention a fourth thinker who is a local favorite, I'm sure, and a national treasure who lives and writes not too far from here, the Kentucky poet and novelist and essayist and farmer, Wendell Berry. Berry speaks to all of these themes that I've touched on tonight, but he frames them with a particular pointed critique of the organization and the deepest assumptions of our modern industrialized economy and its supporting political and educational system. I think Barry, perhaps above all, is one of the greatest, great critics and the one who understands with the greatest perspicacity the nature of the modern university. He is especially a severe critic of the ignorance that arises from the supposed wisdom, or I should say intelligence, that is supposed to arise from our organization of our modern institutions, the very specialization that is supposed to be the basis of our intelligence. The more specialized and segmented our various jobs and, revolt, and roles become, he argues, the greater the depth of our ignorance of our, of our particular actions and of our complicity in a wide range of abuses and degradation of our world and of each other that are not recognizable to us because we are wearing blinkers, to, to, to cite horses again. So the divisions that we live in breaks what should be the fundamental kinship of producer and consumer, of seller and of buyer, of owner and of worker, of product, of parent material and that which is produced, of nature and of artifice, artifice of thoughts and words and deeds. This division that now is the organizing principle of the modern university was actually what the modern, what, what the university originally came into being to overcome the division of ourselves as human beings into separate, into understanding ourselves separately. By denying that there is a kingdom of God and that we are creatures in that creation, we deceive ourselves into thinking that we are its Lord and master, a theme that one finds frequently in Barry's writing, and thus leads not to admit nature's conquest but to a war, a war against nature that we are, by all reports, increasingly losing. Okay. So I've suggested tonight that the modern university is a place that's somewhat, I would say, inhospitable to those of a Christian worldview. A place where a Christian can work, but in which a Christian will be something of a stranger in a strange land. So what is to be done? What are we to do? Oh, I see my time is up, so I, fortunately I can't give you the answer. <laughs> Let me say that at the very least, we need to recognize what it is we are living in, the challenge that we face to understand its nature, and then those waning number of Christian scholars, as well as Christian non-scholars, every Christian citizen, must devote themselves to examining, understanding, and changing this situation in which we live. Now that might take different forms. For some it will be a way of life, for some it might be a form of activism, for some it might be politics. I don't think any of one answer will do the trick. But above all, perhaps we must pray upon and for a world in which such possibilities, such possibilities might lead to an outcome in which this, in which these, this scenario I've described tonight becomes a memory of a worse past and brings about the possibility of a better future. So I thank you for your attention and welcome to questions. All right, well, thanks so much, Dr. Deneen. We are now gonna give you all the opportunity to pester him with some, uh, some questions. So we're gonna move to Q&A time. We've got two mic runners. So if you've got a question, just raise your hand. One of our gentlemanly mic runners will find you. You can ask your question. Dr. Deneen, you can just uh, point them out as you see them. And there you are. Okay, I'm gonna, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, thanks. Hi, as I, uh, as I told you before your uh, talk while we were eating dinner, I'm a professor at Memoria College, which is a new institution trying to go 
back to exactly this kind of vision that you articulated in your, in your talk. Um, and I worry about um, that project, although I'm very excited about it, um, that that involves an abandonment of the existing institutions. Uh, so I'm curious uh, as to your thoughts, um, to what extent should we um, sort of start new institutions uh, along these lines and uh, abandon the attempt to revive the existing institutions? And to what extent do you think the battle is worth fighting and realistically um, winnable to uh, reform the existing institutions and all of their existing capital? So, so the kind of first third of the talk, or maybe the end of the first third of the talk was in some ways touching on this very question and it probably wasn't explicit enough but it was a kind of faint in that direction. And it reflects my worry and anxiety that uh, on the one hand I am deeply grateful and supportive of all of the efforts including your institution, your new institution and many other institutions uh, in the Catholic world. We have lots of little sort of highly orthodox schools that have popped up all over the country, some of which have been uh, sort of clawed back from these tendencies, some of which have been created entirely out of whole cloth. Uh, and those are very hope-giving. Um, on, on the other hand, I guess I would just say the following. The people who run this country are not generally coming from those schools. The people who dominate the institutions of this country, whether it's its government, its industry, its media, its various institutions, voluntary or you know, the, the, big, the big institutions, sports complex and so forth, are generally not coming from these institutions. So here's the, here's the conundrum, and I'm just gonna put it as a conundrum, and I don't have an answer for this. It seems likely if things continue on their current trajectory that if, if I'm right about this, and I don't mean to be too pessimistic, but if I'm right about this, the contradiction at the heart of having the remnant of Christianity in a, in a worldview, amid a worldview that's hostile to Christianity, I'm not the first to observe, leads to a condition in which increasingly Christians will be persecuted. I don't even think it's increasingly, I think Christians are persecuted in various ways, professionally and otherwise. That makes it more and more difficult for an explicit stated Christian to be able to hold various positions in the dominant parts of our society. Not a few people have suggested this is, this is somewhat comparable to the condition of Christians in early Christianity, living under a hostile empire. The difference is, is that the Christians in the early church didn't have these institutions didn't run these institutions. Institutions need generally the kind of atmosphere in which a kind of ecology in which institutions are able to operate. It's a lot easier to shut down institutions, in other words, uh, in the contemporary world. So I think at the end of the day, um, I don't think it's, it's prudent to seed the field of these major organizations to simply being, that's going to be against us. These are going to be hostile to us and we will form our own little lifeboats, our own little arcs. I don't think it's prudent. I think it's necessary, I think it's a, I think it's a necessary and indeed a, a, an admirable uh, step. But I think uh, we need to think as Christians, as people who live in the world prudently, as Augustine would advise us, need to think about what is, what, is, what is to be done, how it is we might be able to reclaim to some extent the institutions that we created, that we built, that were founded by us, and that almost entirely have been lost. Because it's not just um, a, a hostile environment, it creates a hostile world, making it difficult to hold any institutions and I think Christianity has shown at least one thing, which is we are great institution builders. We want to build institutions. So I, I don't have an answer for how we do that. But I do want to, I, I suppose, correct, let's say, tilt the ship that I see increasingly tilting toward the idea Christians have to find 
their lifeboats and say, we need also to fight for institutions in which we have a, a say in shaping the world along the lines of those four principles that I suggested. But I'm in agreement that these are good, good endeavors, necessary endeavors, but I worry they may be insufficient to the task. Yes, you. Um, first, I really enjoyed your talk. I felt very seen. Um, it's good to kind of hear someone have a similar experience. Um, and as a result of that, I experienced a lot of that hostility during my graduate program. Um, and because of that, now teaching first year composition, sometimes I'm a little um, more nervous about the, the text that I might choose for my course. Um, and so I guess my question is, what advice would you have for someone, because I'm relatively new to this as well, um, what advice would you have for Christian educators in higher ed? I thought the last question was hard. I'm a Catholic, so I, my, my knowledge of scripture is lacking. Uh, and that, that's not just a joke. What's the line about wily as serpents and innocent as lambs, right? The wily part uh, is necessary. Um, I, I don't think one should ever be dishonest. I think one should be, I, I, I believe in integrity because it's part of what it is to be integrated, right? I believe in a world that has to be integrated. What I've been talking about tonight is how do we create a world of integration in which things are fundamentally connected and not disintegrated. I think fundamentally the world we're living in is one of disintegration. So at the core and the heart of integration is integrity. So I don't think one should lie, but one also doesn't have to say everything. One doesn't have to say everything, especially in the modern university. Uh, I was generally pretty prudent when I was an untenured faculty member, uh, although I think, it was, I think it was visible that I, you know, as I, as I mentioned at Princeton, it was visible that I wasn't, uh, I wasn't one of the gang. Uh, but at the same time, uh, I did what was necessary from an academic standpoint to do what I needed to do, and when I received tenure, the first book I wrote was Why Liberalism Failed. Uh, I, and, and I'm one, I'm, I know there's like various people, uh, various conservative types who say we should get rid of tenure. Don't get rid of tenure. Because the only thing you would do is expose me and people like me. I mean, the only thing that tenure really is doing is protecting people like me nowadays. It's not protecting people who conform to the faith. So I do think that there is, um, there is a genuine role to be played by faculty who have these positions, and I'm not sure if you're on that path or if you ever will be on that path, but I think if you think you might be, be prudent. But at the same time, you don't, don't be dishonest. And I guess the other thing is, you know, there are, there are a growing number of institutions, uh, and it's not, it's, it's not um, insubstantial, the number of institutions. If one finds it really unbearable to be at the mainstream institutions or a state university. One can look for a position at those institutions. I just think it's really important. I want to stress, I think it's really important for people like us to be in these kinds of places. Yeah. Because these are the places that desperately need people like us. So, yeah, so keep up the good fight. Yeah. Awesome. I see. You're next. Thanks for the Lecture, terrific. Yeah, I like your shirt. I do too. <laughs> I, I, went, I went to Notre Dame. My wife went to Notre Dame. Go Irish. Uh, several uh, niece and nephew went to Georgetown, which I recognize as Catholic in name only, yeah. really, when they're uh, so oppositional. So I'm going to try to form a question that's kind of a what's going on at Notre Dame since you're there, with yeah. kind of a, little, a few little statements along with it. As I've observed, it's unrecognizable from 30 years ago when I was there. So is that a failing of Catholicism and priests and educators and professors at a place where you'd expect them to be the Benedictine principle of hiding out and being the, the place where you saw Catholicism or Christianity kind of perpetuated, but now based on who they're picking for faculty, who they're picking for students, are they picking Catholic families, students from Catholic families, or are they just looking for the mathlete 
squiggle bug trying to promote the biggest academic institution like they are Princeton. So those are some of the things I think about with what uh, Catholicism means to them. I mean, of all places, that's what I'd expect it to be. So me and my extreme disappointment, my wife, when we go up there and visit the place, I say, where, where am I? I might as well be at Princeton. So the place I'd expect it to be, I mean, I expect it to be here at this bubble of liberalism at University of Kentucky, but I don't expect it there. But now I'm seeing it there by who they're picking. So just kind of uh, open-ended, what the heck's going on there of all places? Yeah. So I, I think it's, it's a complicated story, but I, I do think I um, touched on it uh, in particular when I was speaking of the, the kinds of pressures that exist all around and outside the institution. So again, alumni and, you know, Observers will often, you know, sort of look at individuals, like Father Jenkins or the provost or the dean. It's their fault. But I think we have to recognize it's kind of it's an entire environment. This is really what I underscore, and this is really what I was trying to address in the first in response to the first question. It's an entire environment in which this institution is operating, and institutions, qua institutions, as institutions, have a strong incentive and tendency to conform to the dominant spirit of the age. Again, because the people who are in those institutions for a whole variety of various reasons want to be successful and acknowledged on the terms of the broader civilization. Right? So faculty want to be recognized by faculty at Harvard. Students want to have the degree that will get them the job at McKinsey. Parents want to have the, you know, the sticker that they can put in the back window of their Volvo. Uh, you know, administrators want to be able to get a job at a higher ranked university. It, all up and down the line, there's a structure beyond the individual personalities that are exerting this powerful force. Now add to that, Melman might be stepping in something here, but add to that being a Catholic, being Catholics in a dominantly Protestant country where the desire has always in some ways been, we want to be accepted. We want to not be seen as not good Americans. I don't know if you all knew this, if you ever go to a Notre Dame football game, the start of a Notre Dame football game begins with not just the national anthem, we have the preamble of the Constitution and the second paragraph of the Declaration of Independence before the game. We hold these truths to be self-evident. They don't even do that in Texas. <laughs> and they do that at Notre Dame because when the radio broadcast with Root, not, Root, Newt Rockne was going on, this was how they decided to start this, to show the rest of the country that was tuning in that we were good Americans too, right, which was always the fear of, of our Catholics. You were going to obey the Pope and not the President. You were going to be a a fifth column. So the desire to conform is very it's strong in you is the desire to conform. You know, it, it's, it's very strong in the DNA of Notre Dame. So you have these two elements and you can see how these forces combine in a very powerful way. And it would take figures, particularly leaders, president, provost, administrators, a very strong kind of fortitude and spine to resist this. That's not the administrative class today. Right. Now, in the meantime, what's happened is you have um, the broader trends in the society towards secular, secularism and secularization, and that's playing an additional kind of havoc, which is fewer number of Catholic faculty who are qualified. So even if we wanted to hire Catholic faculty, for example, in the sciences, engineering schools, and so forth, it's hard to find them. It's hard to find really good Catholic faculty. It's becoming more and more true in other disciplines as well. So even if we had the really strong administrators with fortitude, it's actually hard to find the kinds of people that you need in these institutions. You have to work twice as hard to find them. You have to, in some ways, as a faculty member, you have to work twice as hard uh, to be both a Christian and a successful faculty member. So it's very, you know, it's very, very challenging. Now, I just, so I want to face this head on by, by saying this is not only a problem of sort of personnel or people with, of bad intentions, it's systemic. It's a systemic issue, which means as Christians in some ways, we also have to be able to think systemically. And I think maybe we've somewhat abandoned that approach. I think as this kind of like the frog being boiled, think more and more about what we as individuals can do, what, how I can be an exemplar of Christian charity, how I can exhibit certain virtues, how I can form a prayer community. It's really daunting to think about it systemically, but I think unless we do that, we're gonna find ourselves more and more put into a corner. 
And a place like Notre Dame is a place where that we should be doing that. And at least a few of us are. Okay, we're gonna take so I, one I more question. Just, uh, and I think we yeah, here? over here. Okay. Last last oh, question okay. of the night here. Having is this on? Yeah. Having been at Princeton, uh, although it was several years ago, I would imagine you are colleagues with Robert George. And uh, of course, he founded the Witherspoon Institute outside of Princeton. Our son got to be a Protestant intern at Witherspoon, which is a great honor. But in talking with the president of the Witherspoon Institute, um, a gentleman from Mexico who works with Robert George told us there are other uh, institutions or other uh, places outside of major universities like Stanford where they have another uh, Witherspoon type organization, something like probably the Lewis House to influence for Christianity on secular campuses. Could you comment on this effort? In a way, this is, oh, sorry, this is a kind of a perfect uh, bookend to the first question, because I think this is, in addition to founding universities, colleges, and new, new, in, new institutions, I think the other main strategy has been the one that you've mentioned, which is at existing institutions, recognizing that there are fewer and fewer faculty and fewer and fewer curricula, you know, programs, and that the curriculum has been you know, non-existent, has been more or less dismantled there's still some number, and in some cases, a sizable number of students who are hungry. And I think arguably a growing number of students who are hungry for meaning, for an understanding, for an encounter with faculty, an encounter with fellow students that go beyond this utilitarian, materialistic, hedonistic understanding of freedom. So that these kinds of programs that exist near or off campus are growing in number, uh, they exist in many, if not most, of the Ivy League schools and many of the elite schools, and also just many schools around the country. And I think you see things, uh, programs like this at many state universities, this, the Lewis House being one of those. I think this is, this is a, um, it's a, it's a model that I think has a lot to recommend it, precisely because it's so difficult to change the trajectory of these institutions that I've been describing. Uh, and th this can be the kinds of, you know, the, the sorts of seeds that can be planted. Now, the hope for me would be that these would be the seeds that would, uh, you know, in some distant time allow for either the, you know, their, the kind of replacement of these institutions, of, of the current, you know, increasingly bankrupt institutions by better institutions, or the seeds by which in the future the existing po uh, institutions will be populated. The, the question and the challenge is how do we pass on this treasure from one generation to the next? The universities were created, I mean, among, for many reasons, you know, to, pursue, to pursue truth, to pursue knowledge, to pursue wisdom, to pursue knowledge of the whole. But one of its key features and why institutions are so important is human beings are unique, we're unique among the creatures in that we can preserve memory. We can preserve memory. No other creature that we know of can pass memory, memory of the past from one generation to the next. This is why, and I'm really mad at myself, I hope tomorrow, I always try to go look at the campus library. Now, I assume it's not beautiful here. It's beautiful. Now, is there an ugly library? It's great, it's beautiful, awesome. So it's generally the case on every college campus that the library is one of the most beautiful buildings on campus because exactly what it represents. It represents the locus where memory is stored. It's the treasure house of what people before us have thought, read, written down, you know, and preserved in a place, and rightly deserves to be one of the most beautiful buildings on campus. Now notice that many modern universities, if they had a beautiful library, they built a new library. That's usually the ugliest building on campus. Precisely because we live in this anti, right, this, this kind of anti-culture, right? The universities no longer are doing the things that they're supposed to do. So we, the Christians, I think especially, like the monks of the Middle Ages, are charged with preserving civilization. And it might be some of these more off-campus institutions. It might be the creation of new institutions. It might be renegade professors, like myself and my friend here, who are trying to push against the spirit of the age.
But above all, I think what we need is the awareness that we have to understand ourselves as living against the grain. We're again, you know, to title of a Howard Ross book, right? We're against the grain in this society, but it doesn't have to be this way. And so I'm rooting for the grain, if I can, I don't know if this is a weird metaphor, but the grain changing direction or the board being turned in a diff different direction. Because I think it is an obligation of ourselves, not merely as Christians to be thinking about the city of God, but how the city of God can be emulated in some ways, not perfectly, but emulated here in the city of man. And that would be the greatest gift we could give to our children. So thank you very much for your attendance tonight. Appreciate it. Well, thank you, Dr. Deneen. That was excellent. Just a few quick things. Visit our website, lewishouse.org, for more about our classes, about the library. You can sign up for our mailing list. There are books in the back, including two of Dr. Deneen's books that you can buy from us. There are refreshments. Please uh, take as many cookies as you can on the way out. And don't forget, December 5th, so it'll be the first Tuesday in December. We'll be here in just back in a few weeks, 7 o'clock, Lewis House. See you then. <laughs>